Hello everyone, Jin Dobre. Uh, we're meeting again on Wednesday uh, at noon in my podcast, uh, Something Singular, Social Sobrivego in Polish. And we have a very special guest today who will talk to us about the intersection of religion, um, economics, and technological innovation. And that's Matt Milligan. Hi, Matt. Hi, Alexandra. Good to be here. Happy to talk about all these subjects yeah. and more. Absolutely. So uh, Matt is, uh, by training, if I understand it correctly, a, a philologist. He's a scholar of uh, religion studies um, who is super interested in economy of religion. And he's a visiting uh, assisting professor at Trinity University, currently also a research fellow like I am here at the AIER. This is where we have met. And should I add anything more? Did I skip anything? Yes, I'm now a newly a research associate at Chapman University in Los Angeles. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I guess the first thing that you have, since I saw your presentation mm -hmm. recently, and it was very, very interesting, was um, so how did it happen? So I understand you're, you were studying philology, and that's obviously a very broad discipline. And you can do many different things, mm -hmm. but your choice was religion. How did that happen? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so technically, uh, I'm a historian of religion who uses philology uh, to kind of get at the the kind of uh, close readings, the the stuff that's between the lines in scripture, right? So that's what a lot of uh, traditional kind of classicists do, right? When they're reading, like I don't know, it doesn't matter if it's a uh, Homer, mm -hmm. right, or if it's the Bible. Uh, generally, the kind of classical way to study old great texts great books if you will is philology so you learn the languages you translate and you kind of read between the lines uh, and so for me um, i wanted to read the great books but i also wanted to read about the non-great books and mm -hmm. also i wanted to read about everyday people okay and i also wanted to study everyday people and so that kind of led me into the realm of what we call like social history uh, and from there you can kind of get a glimpse historically of like you know the real practitioners of of life, right? The real kind of merchants, the real Buddhists, uh, or as real as we can get to, right? Like obviously, you know, we don't have documentary recordings of, of ancient sure. stuff 2000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that led me eventually to start reading uh, really old financial documents uh, from the earliest Buddhists that we possibly can get any access to historically. And so now here I am studying the kind of economics of Buddhism, mm -hmm. which I think to many at home probably seems like a conundrum, right? Uh, where you don't think of like Buddhism and, and wealth or money to, going together. Uh, but nonetheless, Buddhism has survived and it's been financially been very prosperous. That's very interesting. So when you're reading those financial, financial, ancient financial documents, uh, and you're reading uh, between the lines, what is it that you're finding? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm studying uh, ancient India about 2200 years ago, 100 years ago or so. Uh, and th this is the first material culture from Buddhism that we have any access to. And really from ancient India, this is the first uh, material culture, religious material culture that we have for Hinduism or Buddhism. So these are this is a very early glimpse into uh, South Asian history. And uh, so what I'm finding in these financial documents that have been etched onto stone, literally at shrines and at uh, monasteries, at, at stupas or pagodas, as they say in the rest of Asia, um, you find the kind of names and um, interesting kind of demographic information about real people. And there you get a glimpse into their interests, right? Mm -hmm. What were they um, doing with their lives? Not everybody is a professional monk sitting around meditating every day, right? These people have families that they take care of. They have uh, professions. They have, um, I don't know, hobbies and interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, like, in particular, uh, they had certain uh, financial drivers that allowed them to dictate the direction Buddhism would go as a religion. Okay. And so you have prosperity, uh, not poverty, equaling Buddhism from a very early time. Period. Well, that, that's very interesting. And as you said yourself, it's kind of contrary to the public view of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, the question I would have here was, what came first? 
-hmm. or they're like many people who are interested in their own prosperity and the prosperity of their community mm -hmm. and they happen to be buddhists and that kind of shaped buddhism or was it the other way around in the sense that buddhism contains certain ideas that would allow for that to happen i don't know if that's yeah kind of something no, to discern, you, but like hit the nail on the head this is the the historian's problem right mm -hmm. is that it would be great if there were like you know pieces of literature documents that just came out and said this uh, but often we have to take a lot of time and do a lot of archival research or in my case kind of almost archaeological research uh, looking at just what's written but also arts mm -hmm. architecture and also the scriptures uh, and so by using all these sources together in kind of an interdisciplinary way we get a little bit of a glimpse into the kind of institutional history of Buddhism and this is what my work is about okay. this kind of long-term institutional history of, of Buddhism as a developing religious uh, organization, or as I call it, a firm, uh, like a business a firm. firm. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, and so uh, the chicken or egg question is, I would say that there was an existing uh, structure of prosperity um, in- Be Before that? Before mm -hmm. Buddhism or as Buddhism was growing initially. Uh, and Buddhism really took advantage of the existing uh, structure, of probably like mercantile guilds and tradesmen, uh, and first of all, Buddhism, like the Buddha was an expert at converting these people. And he convinced them that the pursuit of their own self-interest actually was a religious pursuit. And that aligns very well with kind of like what we might call like a proto-capitalist uh, ideology. So more of a proto-capitalist and less of an introspection? Yes. Which, yeah? Okay. Well, I would huh. say they go hand in hand, hand, in hand. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, uh, to, you know, this sounds like really rough, but the Buddha himself, right, was extraordinarily self-interested. He left home, abandoned his wife and kids and his father and all of his riches at home, and he went into the forest as a crazy ascetic, <laughs> starving himself, right? And he said, in the end, I'm going to find a cure to all of the life's problems, right? Uh, the rule number one of Buddhism is that life sucks. And so how do you cure that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like a doctor. So he left behind everybody call, causing immeasurable, uh, immeasurable suffering, right? And that was in his own self-interest. And he found the solution according to the mythology. Mm -hmm. And then he went back and, and converted his, his, uh, his wife and his son and his father and so forth. So in the mm -hmm. end, his own self-interest justified the 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 method of getting there so would you say he was kind of egocentric that way and that he promoted this by kind getting of rid attitude? of the ego yes yes <laughs> oh, that, that's a that's a very complex thing here oh, yeah. you know yeah that's a, hard, a heavy idea to kind of unpack mm -hmm. for me how you can kind of advocate for mm -hmm. being not egocentric through this very first kind of step yes of like withdrawing from the mm -hmm. community and you know other people's needs but that's kind of interesting and and buddha himself was was quite privileged right do i understand oh correctly? yes definitely yeah. his his story is uh quintessentially like a richest rag story right mm. so there is this notion that in order to achieve like you know spiritual riches and get you know achieve the ultimate goal uh, you have to abandon everything Mm -hmm. But what he found, actually, that was his path. And but what he found was that that wasn't true. Um, he ended up reversing course and uh, the monastic life as he taught it and the kind of life as a, as a Buddhist, even not as a monk or a nun, mm -hmm. is one of um, actually uh, prosperity and one of, of looking after one's family if you're uh, a lay person. And also, uh, if you're a monk or a nun, also looking after your brothers and sisters. And is that how prosperity is defined by like, you know, mm -hmm. checking if every, sure. everybody's yeah. okay, mm -hmm. sort of, and you know, everybody's sort of progressing? Yes, yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's it's uh, it's about the, this um, one's own spiritual progress, mm -hmm. right? But if you are a monk or a nun, um, it's hard to make spiritual progress when the people you're living with are not making any progress. That's right. True. And if they're suffering from immense poverty or illness, um, you're not going to make any progress mm -hmm. because you have to constantly care for them. Mm -hmm. But if they are making progress, then they're also going to have spiritual and financial prosperity. Yeah. So that that's the whole kind of the, the Sangha, the church, what we call of, of Buddhism um, as an organization. And if you're a lay person, generally, there's this idea of uh, good karma can only come through good works mm -hmm. but specifically the best kind of good works are donations of money 
to the monks or not. That's very interesting. So you like you, a modern day charity. In fact, yes. Like oh yeah, charity. for sure. But mm -hmm. you gain the most uh, good karma mm -hmm. uh, theoretically by um, building um, not just hospitals or things like this, but religious monuments, buildings, uh, constructing shrines, these sorts of things. So being a really generous patron, right? And that goes for like, you know, all modern institutions, mm -hmm. right? If you, uh, are interested in uh, lots of social capital, like okay. you donate a wing to a hospital, right? And you get your name on the building. It's not really any different in this system, uh, except for you're donating a wing to the monastery. Mm -hmm. But does this mean that um, actually, when you think about the first followers of, of Buddha and, and early Buddhism, because mm -hmm. obviously now it's a very big mainstream sort of religion uh, practiced worldwide, but like were the first followers wealthy people should i understand that i mean that way yes. that well they had to afford mm -hmm. to kind of you know um to kind of demonstrate this charity yeah so my understanding is that they had to have the wealth that's right yeah so. so just like the buddha came from uh the ruling class uh, mm -hmm. his father was probably some sort of local chieftain or maybe king to use that translation which is a little bit controversial why <laughs> uh, his followers, um, from the best we can tell, both from the historical evidence and the scriptural evidence, most of his like first uh, converts were coming from also the upper crust. And uh, so in India, you have a, a very complicated caste system um, that kind of is an indicator of financial status as well, not although not always, especially in the modern period. Uh, but we know that his, his um, initial followers were very well-to-do, and we know that the Buddha scripturally um, made rules that if you were in debt or if you were a slave, and in ancient India they had actual real slaves, um, if you were in debt or if you were a slave, you could not become a monk or a nun. And mm -hmm. you have to take vows initially, day one of, of becoming a monk or a nun, you have to take vows that obligate you that you don't have any debts. Oh, that's so interesting. So basically, if you are um, not well off or you're not prosperous, you're not even able to become a monk or a nun. That's so interesting. And so kind of what happens further? Because in your presentation, you also talk about great kind of advancements in, in terms of like the market, mm -hmm. you know? Um, intersecting with buddhism and also technological innovation yes. intersecting with buddhism so could you elaborate on yeah that a bit? Uh, so my work uh, focuses on uh, what i call disruptive religious innovations hmm. and so these uh take um the idea of technology and if we reinvent the idea of technology as something that makes life more uh, efficient or more prosperous easier, or easier, easier mm -hmm. right for everyday lives then technology isn't just like inventions it, it is also um, ideas or strategies mm -hmm. right so i'm kind of taking this very inclusive broad look at what technology is so these disruptive uh, technologies are um, both inventions and also strategies uh, to make the religious firm of Buddhism more prosperous. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, that also means it transmits across the cultures. firm or individuals, or is that like both? How does that play out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the transmission of Buddhism is very unique in the history of Asia because uh, many other Asian religions didn't cross borders very well. And Buddhism. Um, Can you provide any examples? Of sure. Understand? Yeah. So Buddhism mm -hmm. um, uh, crossed the border very early uh, into uh, Central Asia and then into Southeast Asia and into China as well. And mm -hmm. it spread like wildfire. Hindu Why? Why? Well, I know it's a, like, the, a loaded <laughs> question. But oh, like, yeah. That, that's my argument is yeah. that it was these technological innovations, uh -huh. uh, disruptive techno technological innovations. And if we compare this to, say, Hinduism or Jainism, also developed in, in, in India around the same time mm -hmm. period, they did not travel very well. It's not until much, much later that they, these religions spread. So there was this mm -hmm. uh, idea that Buddhism, uh, my idea, kind of piggybacking on a bunch of uh, very uh, erudite scholars of the past, um, that Buddhism uh, took advantage of having a very kind of liberal attitude towards markets. And so that means converting merchants, but also that means uh, going with the merchants on their adventures on the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And so everyone wanted the silk from China. Of course, uh, that's a great proxy to yeah. spread. 
Oh yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, and Buddhism was like, Hey, let's go over there and see what's over there. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, there were a lot of rules, very strict rules about, uh, Brahmins, for instance, traveling, mm -hmm. uh, because there was a lot of purity rules In Buddhism, they get rid of a good number of the ideas about purity. So, uh, traveling long distances with uh, caravans mm -hmm. across the Himalayan mountains or something like that, or across deserts, yeah. um, doesn't really matter, doesn't phase them. Okay. Theoretically. Okay. And now uh, about these, you know, disruptive technological innovations, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So what, what did that entail? You know? Yeah. So on one side of the kind of technological innovations that are like more like strategies, uh, Buddhism was very receptive to uh, including women into the fold. So I consider mm -hmm. this a technology. And uh, so they included women by allowing women to become nuns, which was great. But my uh, real it's discovery... It's half of the population of the world. So it's half the population, right? Mm -hmm. So it increases your numbers officially, like the professional mm -hmm. members. Uh, but then they also made a huge effort to include um, women financially. And I don't know if this included exactly like financial literacy in the kind of modern terms of mm -hmm. banking, uh, but it, 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 there were pilgrimage locations for Buddhism where they would solicit donations. Uh, so this would essentially be like centers of banking, I guess, along very important roads. And uh, along these roads, we know that they were um, soliciting from vast uh, numbers of women that were having their names put up on walls, on monuments, monasteries and shrines. And all so these they sorts became of the donors, official they donors. They became a, mm -hmm. official donors equal to that of men. And mm -hmm. um, I can document with my research that it was the kind of financial incentives, or sorry, financial, uh, the, the wealth, right, mm -hmm. and kind of religious incentives uh, for women that made it possible for Buddhism to spread mm -hmm. and so and spread so efficiently, I think. That's great. That's uh, so interesting. Yeah. And then what follows? Sort of, you know, you have so, this initial spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it takes uh, it takes Buddhism a little bit of time to kind of start spreading. Uh, but then once it does, it really catches on to this idea that like, hey, we should not only be inclusive of a bunch of people, maybe we should also take advantage of another technology like writing. Mm -hmm. And this sounds like really silly to us in the modern period. We take things for like writing and printing for granted. Uh, but in ancient South Asia, and actually ancient Asia in general at this time period around, uh, you know, first century BC or so, there wasn't much writing. And they, they weren't producing um, a ton of papyrus, for instance, like in ancient Egypt. They had birch bark mm -hmm. and they had writing utensils, uh, but they didn't do much writing. But the first writing that we have uh, is essentially religious writing. Mm -hmm. And so they were, uh, first they were documenting, um, uh, scriptures, important, uh, uh, sutras and whatnot, but then eventually they were, um, also documenting, uh, these financial records that I was reading. And were they also encouraging other people, uh, you know, the newcomers to write? Because I, I have the impression, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. I, I am not an expert in this field, but I, I have the impression that, uh, every now and then various religious movements rather want to prevent innovation mm, and definitely. spread of knowledge, transfer of knowledge from happening mm -hmm. so that people stay consistent and, and faithful sort of. And, and yes. they're afraid of uh, new ideas, new waves of technological mm -hmm. you know, disruptions, innovations, and uh, they're just afraid of their consequences. So here that yeah. seems to be a sort of a, a different uh, kind of approach. Yes. Uh, so the, the writing um, really allowed new markets to form, right? Hmm. Because now they could, and this is why it's disruptive, right? I kind of take the Christensen uh, view on disruption there. Uh, these new markets were formed and allowed um, uh, new people to enter the fold, right? So when you, like, like women were able to uh, donate to the religious, uh, the Buddhist Sangha, right? They were, they're given a certain amount of agency. Right? Yeah. And so this allows um, this allows them to have power in terms of like what they want to see at church, for instance. Right. Uh, if you're a big donor to a university. Right. Um, if you donate the money to build a football stadium. Well, obviously, you want to see better football. 
Mm -hmm. And so that kind of goes hand in hand. Now, uh, it's a very cynical kind of perspective, I think, right? And pragmatic. It's, it's <laughs> pragmatic, right? Uh, so we see that um, it's only in these times of what we can call kind of like, you know, market embracements, right? Um, every every like 100 to 150 to 200 years, we see a period of, of outright like change. And that goes for most religions as well, right? You see these kind of uh, what I call like oscillating like business cycles. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I'm writing my book on this theory of the oscillating business cycle of religion. One famous one is the invention of the printing press in Europe, right? Sure. That was uh, uh, absolutely mind-blowing, I think, to mm -hmm. the people. But there was also a lot of resistance yes. towards this technology. Yeah, and that mm -hmm. disrupted, uh, to mm -hmm. use my term there, right, the religious market of Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And then you have the entire Protestant Reformation piggybacking on this ability to mass produce texts. Yes. And um, and make it accessible. Yeah, ex accessible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, there's uh, some recent studies uh, that's been done on the economics of, of the Protestant Reformation and the printing press that really show that that cities in Germany that already had printing presses mm -hmm. and that already had mechanical clocks they were more receptive to these new ideas. So we see that technology was driving uh, open-mindedness, I think. Mm -hmm. um, or a change of perspective, both, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at things from a slightly different angle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess. And like in Buddhism, would you say that also, is this sort of, well, I don't want to call it egocentric because that's not about that, mm -hmm. but like, um, do you think there is a connection also between technological innovation and this sort of introspective aspect of Buddhism that you're trying to, I don't know, uh, reflect on your own needs? What is it that you really need uh, in order to flourish or develop yourself? And, yes. and therefore, you're trying to uh, look for better solutions in, in your environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the goal of any really effective religion right or scripture is to like maximize uh, religious opportunities mm -hmm. and i think buddhism does that very uniquely because it gives so much uh power to uh, uh so much ability to the the self uh they would say there is no self but so much uh, power to the individual right to choose Mm -hmm. and uh both choose so there is no self but there's the individual well there's the individual i'm sure it's their, trickier than that actions, but like right it's yeah karma mm -hmm. versus um mm -hmm. uh the fruits of karma so mm -hmm. it's very philosophical and uh, it's not my expertise um but this this uh, this idea that you yourself can achieve liberation mm -hmm. is very powerful right even financially right that i can no matter what my birth status is Right. I can play the market. I can be the best businessman or worker that I can possibly be, save for um, uh, save for retirement and I can retire a millionaire. Right. It's like I can do that spiritually and I can do that um, uh, physically in this world. Right. And then you dissolve. Well, and then you die and then you start over. But... Or you achieve those <laughs> higher states where you don't need those markets and all those communities uh, anymore, which always to me was like this interesting, this well, interesting kind of, you know, not contradiction really, mm -hmm. but like I, I had trouble understanding, you know, a, a few different layers, I guess mm -hmm. my knowledge of, of Buddhism is very narrow, but it mm -hmm. seemed like, you know, there is a certain contradiction between what you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. the market oriented activity oriented yeah, yeah. pattern um, uh, and sort of attitude um, with, well, the idea that you should abandon it all. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, um, on one hand, caring about others, on the other hand, removing yourself from mm -hmm. others. So uh, let me push back on that all just right, a little yeah. bit. And uh, what is, you know, let me ask you a question. What mm -hmm. does it look like when you are uh, achieving a higher state and you are abandoning the world? I just imagine it not being a person who I think achieved it at, at any point in my life, to be honest and humble. By the end of this way. conversation. Yeah, but oh, hopefully. I mean, I'm hopeful <laughs> for that. But like, um, I guess it's a more of a bird's eye view, mm -hmm. right, on things. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're you can participate in them, but probably the way in which you participate in them will be very different. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we see this uh, with monks and nuns, right? Uh, Buddhist monks and nuns are professional ascetics, right? They've given up, um, they've taken vows. Of I love this job, job yeah. description. Oh, professional yeah. Professional ascetic. Yeah. And uh, in, in traditionally, um, it was only the kind of virtuosos that would even meditate. So you don't even need to meditate. 
nowadays it's become encouraged. Um, so it's like a long path and oh, yeah. where, wherever you're, you're getting or wherever yes. you get in the future, that's still okay. You know, that's you don't right. have to mm -hmm. reach those mm -hmm. other states. But my, my mm -hmm. point here, even if you're a professional monk or nun and you're reaching these states, right, you're taken care of. Like you have food brought to you every day. You have shelter provided for you. You have bedding, you have robes given to you. You probably even have uh, uh, workers that are uh, washing your robes for you, right? So, so you don't have to worry about Exactly, anything. right? Is, mm -hmm. Isn't it much easier to achieve a higher state of consciousness when you have- Well, all uh, the fleet? obstacles are removed already. <laughs> exactly. Sure, mm -hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> and so the, you know, one of the fundamental characteristics of a Buddhist monk or nun is that they are originally supposed to be begging, right? They go on alms rounds. Mm -hmm. But if you ask pretty much any modern day monastic, most monastics modern day, uh, going on alms rounds is awful. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. actually um, better uh, to not go on alms rounds because then you have a dedicated um, um, group of, of lay people to come into the monastery to cook for you. And if you have to go on alms rounds, that means you're not sponsored. That means uh -huh. that you're not a great teacher or nobody cares about what you're doing or you. So you uh, do get a validation yeah, in this. Yeah, sort of for sure. And it's, and it's a, um, you know, it's a, a prosperity validation, right? You've achieved something, uh, a, a level of prosperity where you don't have to worry about these things, right? So it's like a recommendation system. If you have five stars, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm sorry for, uh, yeah. you know, this no, comparison. No, I've, but... I've written on this exact <laughs> uh, uh, subject of trust. Ah, right. Okay. And, and that's why the, the market analogy is perfect here, I think, because when you have trust between buyer and seller mm -hmm. and, you know, reducing religion to, uh, you know, a, a commodity that's being sold right to the end user eventually. Right. Um, then if there's no trust, you're unwilling to purchase. Yes. But that's why these older religions tend to have more trust built up because they have like so many years of like you know what, I know what a monk looks like. I know what a Catholic priest is supposed to be doing, right? Whether or not they actually do these things or whether or not you actually trust them, that's a whole different question, right? Yeah. But they look the part. Okay. And the, the institution looks the same. Mm. And so there's this kind of uniformity, right? If you go into a McDonald's anywhere in the world, you get virtually the same experience. Well, that's the whole idea. Yeah. You always feel at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. Hopefully, I guess. Kind of. I mean, but you know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, what is mitigated is any risk of a negative surprise. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's the whole concept. Yeah. Okay. And that, no, I kind of fast forward um, mm -hmm. because I would like to pick your brain a, a bit on this topic. Um, Buddhism is obviously, you know, developing. We've seen how it became maybe I shouldn't say like a mainstream religion, but a very popular religion in the West. When did that really start <laughs> here in the US also yeah. in Europe? Sure. Uh, so it's, it's been a long time coming, actually. Um, in the 19th century, uh, in the United States, there was a slow, like kind of a, a slow growing interest in kind of the philosophy from the kind of Orient. Right. And you got mm -hmm. um, like Henry David Thoreau sitting on Walden Pond reading the mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita. And he also, in addition to the Bhagavad Gita, he had uh, some early translations of some Buddhist sutras and mm -hmm. things like this. I even remember Heidegger because by training I'm a philosopher, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, he got super interested in Zen Buddhism. And at some point he mm -hmm. said that I think he traveled to, to Japan at some point and he said, well, that's something I always wanted to express in my phenomenological concepts, but I never managed. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's a bit later, but yeah, like yeah. a similar period, you know, er, early uh, 20th century, century, late yeah. 19th century. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, there's uh, there was a slow growing interest amongst the elites, right? Mm -hmm. The literary elites, I think of Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the it was the World's Fair at the very end of the 19th century in Chicago, where you had a, um, a, a speaker, uh, Swami Vivekananda, that came and he really propagated Hinduism and a very specific kind of Hinduism as well. He rejected uh, a bunch of forms of yoga that were already kind of circulating in the United States at the time. He rejected them. Yes. And he uh -huh. said, my form of yoga is the best form but mm -hmm. because he had this massive audience uh, at the World's Fair there. And he, he he became kind of the standard icon for like a kind of a philosophical yoga. 
And then in the, in the 20th century, um, you have a slow building movement towards like physical fitness and um, staying healthy, staying and, healthy, yeah. exactly. Eating better, but also um, and this self care. Is, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is uh, some research I'm doing now, right, is in this uh, notion of self help. And, and uh, you know, Americans have always loved the pull yourself up by the bootstraps notion. And in the 19th century, that took off. But in the 20th century, you have this huge influx of, of self-help manuals and positive, the power of positive thinking mm -hmm. that became um, essentially like nowadays, we would say it's like synonymous with like, you know, mindfulness. And it, it took mm. about 50 years for mindfulness to kind of make its way to that market. But here we are, here we are. And, you know, thanks to... Uh, the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, uh, the kind of like the the kind of uh, hippie radical movements uh, that almost um, were endorsed by a number of celebrities like the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have these kind of cultural entrepreneurs like the Beatles that I made thought it... George Harrison, uh, what was that his name? He practiced mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Yeah, uh, I mean, they experimented with a bunch of stuff. They, okay. they brought mm -hmm. in uh, the whole journey. Oh, different the, whole oh, spectrum oh, yeah, different religions. for sure mm -hmm. um they brought in the transcendental meditation mm. um the founder of that movement its name is slipping my mind at this moment uh and this opened the doorway to things like zen to become very popular zen was already being practiced in california and brooklyn and things like this mm -hmm. but uh became very mainstream in the 70s and you have you know the, the publication of zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and things like this uh, and then eventually, um, the, uh, the plight of the Tibetans in the 80s, 1980s, yeah. um, took a certain kind of Buddhism and made it mainstream in a political way, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to be a political radical, uh, you would have a Save Tibet sticker. Um, and then that became... Um, but that was still associated, sorry to disturb yeah, you, like yeah, yeah. I hear, like um, uh, with count, count, uh, counterculture, sort of, yeah. right? Uh, 1990s well, okay. you have, you have uh, basically in the 1990s you have the legitimation of uh meditation yoga uh and you have new um products that were mm -hmm. being developed to market these things mm -hmm. and that's where the legitimation really really came through and, and the right? products were what like the products like, to market these yeah things, like, like a yoga mat Okay. yoga pants mm -hmm. right or yoga i don't know what the, the yoga yeah yoga pants yoga outfits yoga mm -hmm. outfits right sing tibetan singing bowls yeah um uh and you have uh basically this kind of what scholars have called like the the kind of you know rapid secularization of asian religions mm -hmm. uh and that, i mean taoism is included there too but uh you know zen what, what's happened to, to Buddhism and Hinduism in particular with yoga and mindfulness is extremely powerful, right? Yes. And the market forces, you know, these are hundreds of billions of dollars. That absolutely, are at play. absolutely. We, we <clears throat> have even uh, conducted an experiment uh, or we were tracking how people behaved in wild hmm. urban greeneries and we used a, um, uh, a headband that is an EEG headband that, you know, re records your um, brainwaves sort of <laughs> and tells you a bit about the state wow. of mind, but actually, the main uh, concept uh, to introduce this particular headband to the market was not so that you know that it's used by researchers like myself to conduct research but actually it was supposed to be and i think it is to some extent a mindfulness and biofeedback device wow. and you have plenty of these right so obviously mm -hmm. i understand you have workshops you have teachers mm -hmm. but you also have even devices and technological gadgets now addressing mindfulness that tell you okay you can perhaps reach that stage a bit quicker in a more mm -hmm. efficient way we know you have little time because mm -hmm. you're a busy person so how about we accelerate that for you with this great uh, technology yeah and, and you know i think the wearables mm. market right yeah. is just ripe for for something to come in and we i mean we're seeing this a little bit with the app store on uh I, like the apple app store uh where you have like headspace calm calms being endorsed by lebron james yeah. or funded angel invested by lebron james i believe mm -hmm. um and you know this is becoming um even my wife who is a rabid atheist uh, she would never be interested in meditation she's rejected meditation every corner i came home for one day and she was like oh i'm just listening to the calm app right now mm -hmm. and i was like do you know what that is and she's yeah. like yes i know <laughs> and uh so it's it's found a way to um through this kind of commodification i think mm -hmm. um these religions have found a way to rebrand 
Uh, but was events. is that kind of I know it's again a hard question, but yeah. was that the intention or is it just chaos? You know, it's like you know some <laughs> things become super uh, complex, and obviously their spread is no longer controllable. So they land on a certain market in a certain environment, mm -hmm. and they just kind of take off there in a completely different direction than the sort of initial one. Is that something that has happened with I don't know big tech, wearable technologies, yeah, yeah. and Buddhism? For instance, here in the United States. Yeah, I would say it's um, not a coincidence that Buddhism is, is one of these uh, religions that's being that's fitting so well into this mm. capitalist marketplace because they're kind of modern day American capitalism. Uh, because my argument is that Buddhism from the very very beginning has been very receptive to market changes. Yes, sure. And so, I mean, Buddhism was even finding a way to kind of. Uh, it's like this, you know, malleable like Play-Doh, right? That kind of fits into whatever environment you throw it into. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in like Soviet Mongolia, for instance, you know, Buddhism was finding a way. Yeah. Even in, uh, you know, CCP-controlled China, Buddhism is finding a way mm -hmm. and hasn't just been eradicated, uh, but has is finding ways to, to flourish. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of publications recently about. Uh, you know, Tibetan markets uh, selling like Tibetan Buddhist trinkets and things like this in in uh, modern day China, like in, in this on the streets, uh, because there is an interest, a curiosity. And even if they're not practicing Buddhists, they still are like, you know what, maybe there's some health benefit to this. Right. Yeah. At least that. At least. <laughs> right. And then if I get any sort of spiritual benefit yeah. from it, it's, it's like bonus. It's a win win. Sure. Like 20 bucks well spent on a singing bowl or something. Yeah. But what you also mentioned in your presentation was you, you've provided a few examples of extremely successful, you know, uh, technology developers like Jack Dorsey. That's right. Who <laughs> kind of explicitly mm -hmm. claimed that, you know, Vipassana is something that they practice, mm -hmm. that they associate themselves with Buddhism. So um, it kind of seems that it's one of those religions, if not the only one that can really, um, really fit well with technological acceleration agenda. Am I correct here? Like I, I, I do believe so, you know, and again, I, I would point to uh, what uh, one scholar in particular is called the culture of growth. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Buddhism really, uh, in all of its different forms, really fosters this idea of growth. Mm -hmm. And um, what better place uh, for, for growth and uh, for also experimentation, which Buddhism, has always been at the forefront of experimentation. It as favors well. experimentation. Oh, definitely. Uh -huh. And uh, in Silicon Valley, right? You you see uh, both the culture of growth and experimentation. Uh, and so, what I mean by experimentation, um, Buddhist monks uh, from the very early period in, in Buddhist history, they were staring at dead bodies, and by staring at dead bodies in cemeteries, mm -hmm. they were watching these dead bodies decay. For and how long? for weeks at a time. I mean, I mean, they would probably go and sleep and come back, right? Maybe sure. have a meal. Yeah. <laughs> but what happens then is mm -hmm. that you, by having this meditation on a decaying dead body, to us it sounds disgusting, right? And there's still some people- Intriguing, but disgusting. Yeah. Right, for sure. You gain insights into the human body that other people would never get because they refuse to look or yeah. they refuse to, yeah. to really uh, think about, right? So this kind of idea of like critical inquiry through mindfulness or uh, you know some sort of uh, meditation technique um, allows uh, this idea of like experimenting in your, inside your head, right? And that's where all the best ideas come from in tech, mm -hmm. right? It's like some sort of spontaneous or uh, soul searching. And so, then, oh yeah, yeah all sorts of stuff, things, right? Yeah. yeah, and and so fundamentally, if you have an open mind, right, and you have this ability to kind of conceive of some sort of dream where. Uh, you can become liberated through this idea, um, then, you know, to me, that's a quintessential kind of American pull mm. yourself up by the bootstraps idea. <laughs> like... It's so interesting that all these overlaps. <laughs> and I just thought of one more uh, thing since we will be kind of wrapping up soon. But like, um, you know, I, I know very little of Nirvana or about Nirvana mm -hmm. and the state of Nirvana. But I, I do know that there are many people in my field, which is artificial intelligence, who are saying, when we finally connect ourselves fully to AI systems with their robustness and mm -hmm. uh, you know their uh, capability of to process information in a very efficient way, we will probably sort of melt in that you know mm -hmm. noosphere in that uh, in the, in the informa information ocean sort of. And some people 
have made those comparisons and they said like ultimately in the future where i don't know it's obviously speculative but when singularity arrives and if we merge with all those machines we will uh, lose our identity as we know it and our subjectivity mm. as we know it and we will just become completely different entities that will be um, less egocentric or or definitely selfless yeah. in a way so so there is a and you hear an echo of that in the silicon valley and mm. among many you know data scientific ai communities that they're kind of interested in that completely different notion of, of the self or self-transformed or shared mm -hmm. self and that technology would be an enabler of that so does that kind of resonate with buddhism in any way or contemporary so buddhism the uh the moment of enlightenment for the the buddha right enlightenment's really a horrible translation of nirvana uh it's really um, enlightenment is a is a very classical western <laughs> exactly. term yes so, that's why yeah, it's bad right? yeah uh so nirvana is just kind of nirvana it's 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 liberation might be a better uh kind of translation that's more common really it's like the literal etymology is like breathless without breath so it's like not needing to breathe no no it's like um breath in the terms of like the physical body but also like karmically right uh -huh. that it's just your mm -hmm. karma is blown out that's what nirvana is blown out mm -hmm. uh so at the moment of nirvana the buddha gains supernatural powers mm -hmm. and this is exactly i think what the singularity is that you're talking about right the first supernatural power or one of the first that he gains i forget the order exactly uh but is he's able to see all of his past lives mm -hmm. right and not just all of his past lives all of his past actions and all of his past thoughts mm -hmm. so he gains this immense amount of knowledge right and you know and the kind that of he can access whenever That's... he just know he doesn't yeah. have to access it. it's just there it's on the forefront right okay so it's like having a, a solid state drive yeah <laughs> I, I guess <laughs> uh and then the second supernatural power that he gains is that he's able to see everybody's karma and everybody's past lives mm. and not just everybody that had lived at that point 2400 years ago everybody in the future as well because it's just everybody everybody mm -hmm. all sentient beings so even the cockroaches he, he knew everything about them mm -hmm. so imagine right that you know everything about he's like the matrix <laughs> right in a way he's, you know because uh, yeah the matrix kind of generates obviously <laughs> yeah you know obviously it's a popular cultural re yeah. reference but Again, the technological ones. It's like, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. imagine what you could do with just that knowledge, right? That mm -hmm. it's like infinite knowledge. It's all knowledge rolled mm -hmm. up in one and all experience. That's the big thing is that it's not just knowledge, like, you know, some, you know, theoretically, um, uh, someone could memorize the, you know, all the encyclopedias, right? And then you have all of human knowledge uh, accumulated or most of it, let's say, right? The kind of big ideas. But does that help you um, tie your shoes? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. right in order to tie your shoes right you need some sort of uh experiential knowledge as yeah well, tacit right? knowledge right uh the uh, knowledge I, that you wouldn't be able to verbalize yeah. even but it's right, but it's in right, there right. embodied in your experience yes mm -hmm. yes and so that combined with all that knowledge right then you have something special uh and then of course there's this karmic element of that you know he had generated so much merit over infinite lifetimes that he was able to release himself mm. uh so you know I think that Buddhism is very receptive to the idea of a singularity. Um, how it fits in, I have no idea. I guess if I knew, I would create a Well, products. maybe we'll see <laughs> in the future, you know, but because I guess, you know, that there is no clear reference yet, mm -hmm. but um, since it's so widespread in circles where technology is this mm -hmm. very big thing and, and taken very seriously, mm -hmm. we may actually see how these two somehow combine, at least conceptually yeah and, and and that that's where the notion of compassion comes from right because mm. if you can see or have knowledge and uh, of everybody else's experience then how can you not have compassion for you know somebody that is uh, if you're an evil ai you will not have well then perhaps they don't have the experiential knowledge then of yeah. what it means to actually suffer the affective probably the affective, affective component yeah. would be missing here yeah well th so, there are know. so many links that's so interesting uh matt thank you so much um yeah, thank you for i me. feel like uh we'll, we will have to talk more in the future yes. and it will be great to uh to discuss with you some of these concepts and who knows perhaps in a year or two we'll mm -hmm. have uh new knowledge about how uh ai and, and buddhism intersect but mm -hmm. uh thank you again for being here yeah thank you um and i'll see all of you next wednesday in socio sobrivego uh bye bye for now
Bye.